Now we've got the host of Justice Matters on YouTube, 30-year former federal prosecutor, Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, thank you so much for coming on. Great to be with you, Brian. So uh, I, I bet you, you wish you never never made yourself the guy who I'd call every time there's a legal issue uh, in Trump world because uh, it's, it's, it's cost you now. It's heating up, I'll tell you. All right, so let's let's get started with the newest bit of news, and I'm gonna do my best not to not to have our interviews immediately become obsolete, which is something that we've encountered uh, a lot of times in the past with the way that things move so quickly. But the DOJ revealed that there were 43 empty folders with classified banners on them at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, Glenn, do you think they came that way? Like, what are the implications of finding empty classified document folders? Yeah, I can't imagine Trump said, "Here's what I want you all to pack up at the White House. I'm gonna need you to." take those 43 empty folders that used to contain classified information. I'm going to need you to take those 28 empty folders that say on them, return to staff secretary slash military aid. I'm going to need you to deliver all of those to my office proper. In case anybody (laughs) wonders if it was my office, I've named it 45 office. And Brian, that's just some of the empty classified documents folders that were found at Mar-a-Lago. There were also several found in a storage facility across multiple boxes. Nobody, nobody packages up empty classified documents folders to move them to their new digs. This is about as, it went from bad to worse to extraordinarily dangerous for our national security. I guess at this point, all we can do is surmise where those documents went. I mean, what what seems like the most likely explanation? I know that we're treading on like, treading on shaky ground because because I guess the only person who can really say is Trump and or investigators uh, who've looked into this, but what's the most likely explanation as to why there are empty classified documents? So the ground under our feet might have become a little firmer in the last 60 minutes or so because the reporting just broke that a Russian oligarch by the name of Viktor Veskelberg has right now, as we speak, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are searching his New York and Florida properties. And they they, they are seen carrying boxes out of those properties. Do we know whether that's related to this morning's revelation that Donald Trump had empty classified documents, folders. We don't, might be pure coincidence, but I think we have to wait and see. You know, I I hate to speculate, but it seems to me that Donald Trump very likely exploited those documents in some way for his own benefit, whether that was financial, whether it was for blackmail, whether it was to leverage future business deals he might have in other countries. I think we're going to begin to learn more about that. But I've talked to some national security folk who were able to answer questions that I had like, if you have an empty folder with a classified banner on it, might you be able to tell what that folder used to contain? And I was told, yes, we do have ways to figure that out. And Brian, I had a TSSCI clearance when I was an army prosecutor handling an espionage case out of Desert Storm. And can I tell you that scared the bejesus out of me? I didn't want to say or do or touch something I shouldn't. I was super careful. But, you know, this is as potentially dangerous and damaging as it gets to our nation. Just as a quick aside, what's the punishment for any other person other than Donald Trump if they were found to have uh, had been in possession of documents like these? Uh, prison, a prompt arrest, a prompt indictment, a prompt prosecution, probably a guilty plea, which is how most of these cases involving mishandling of government classified materials, you know, play out. People typically will plead guilty and the government will debrief them out the wazoo to make sure we know everything that might result in damage to our national security. But we can use the concrete example of a Department of Just, excuse me, a Department of Defense executive assistant named Asia Janae Lavarello, who was serving in Hawaii with the federal government, mishandled a secret document and also failed to tra- failed to transmit 
some handwritten notes she had taken that she was authorized to take at a meeting at which classified information was discussed. She failed to transport her notes in a secure diplomatic pouch. This year, she was put in prison for three years. Donald Trump has a tea time tomorrow after doing a million times more by way of criminal conduct and potential damage to our national security than Miss Lavarello did. But still, he's the most persecuted person in history. So just he is that. actually the most investigated and least prosecuted person <laughs> right. in the history of our nation. So there are two statutes at play here. There's the Presidential Records Act, which really has no enforcement mechanism. And then there's the Espionage Act, which has some pretty major penalties that go along with it. Can you speak about the differences here and how those things apply in this situation? Yeah, so the Presidential Records Act, as you say, has no teeth. There are lots of laws on the books that are basically guidelines for how federal government employees and officers should operate. Actually, like the Hatch must, Act, for example. The Hatch Act has no teeth. You can, you can, you know, receive a slap on the wrist if you violate the Hatch Act. That is, if you engage in political activity as a government employee, because that's prohibited. You may even get, you know, a, a, a letter of condemnation in your permanent file, but it doesn't really have any teeth to it. But the Espionage Act provisions sure do. And under 18 U.S.C. 793, it sure seems like Donald Trump has mishandled national defense information. The reason I say it seems like he has violated that statute is because that's one of the statutes cited in the search warrant for which the judge found there was probable cause to believe that statute had been violated and that there was evidence of that crime on the property of Mar-a-Lago. Now, what is Trump facing here? Like, give me the spectrum of punishments that we could see and, you know, from from best in his case to, to worst and also what you think is most likely. For openers, Donald Trump is facing 20 years in prison. And here's why. One of the three federal statutes listed in the search warrant is obstructing an official investigation or an official proceeding. And that one is a lay down winner for the government. I don't say that lightly or cavalierly because there's no such thing as a bulletproof case. Prosecutors can lose any case or a jury can hang in any case that we choose to prosecute. But Donald Trump was subpoenaed to turn over the additional materials he had at Mar-a-Lago and he flat out refused. And then we had to get a federal prosecutors had to get a search warrant. They went in there and they found a veritable mountain of documents that were responsive to the subpoena. That is a fairly easy obstruction case to prove that carries with it 20 years in prison. Potentially, that's the maximum punishment. So for openers, that's a relatively easy charge to prove on the facts as we know them. What happens to Trump's attorney who signed that sworn statement attesting that all those classified documents that were held at Mar-a-Lago had already been returned? Like, does she get disbarred or could she actually face legal punishment herself? The answer is yes. Both of those <laughs> things are in play. You know, first of all, let me, let me back up. I've talked to a lot of my friends who um, operate kind of at the upper echelons of the white collar defense practice in D.C. Most of them are former prosecutors that I served with many years ago. And I said, look, I've never been a defense attorney, never wanted to be a defense attorney. But my understanding is that defense attorneys never certify that their criminal clients have turned over all of the evidence of crime that they have. You're representing a bank robber. As a defense attorney, it's not really in your job description to certify to the prosecutors. By the way, my client gave back all the money he stole from the bank. That's not the way the practice of law is supposed to play out. So Christina Bob is in potential deep legal jeopardy, not only professional jeopardy, because she will be referred to her state bar wherever she's licensed for an investigation to see whether she should be sanctioned or disbarred. But she is in legal peril because she certified something that is provably false. It's not something she should have certified in the first instance. But uh, and she also now has a conflict right? Anytime an attorney is representing a client and that attorney's conduct is potentially criminal in furtherance of that representation, the attorney has a, has a split loyalty now 
because you have to zealously represent your client, but you also have to keep yourself out of hot water. And those two goals may conflict with one another. So very soon, I expect to see her withdraw from her representation of Donald Trump. Doesn't it kind of not make sense to put yourself and your profession on the line in service of or on behalf of someone like Donald Trump who's known to lie? I mean, like just from a judgment standpoint, wouldn't it be smart of her to have, you know, maybe maybe not predicated her <laughs> this entire thing on trusting what Donald Trump says? Yeah, um, but let's, you know, let's recognize that she is now one of a long line of attorneys that Donald Trump has touched and they have died, right? Every yeah. attorney Donald Trump touches I think, died. I think Michael we're looking Cohen, at Michael, Michael Cohen, got, Lynn Woods, uh, Sidney Powell. Giuliani, yeah. You've got John Eastman. You've got Jeffrey Clark, a little bit of an outlier. He was a yeah. Department of Justice high official who joined Donald Trump's conspiracy to overturn the results of the election. Now it looks like Christina Bob will join that club and perhaps Evan Corcoran, the other lawyer who, according to Christina Bob, is the one who really conducted the search of Mar-a-Lago for additional classified materials and then told me he didn't find any. So you already have two of Donald Trump's lawyers doing a little bit of finger pointing. You had mentioned uh, an opening of 20 years. Is it possible that that Trump could still run for president from prison? Is there any punishment here that would preclude him from being able to hold federal office? No, uh, the, the restrictions on somebody running for the presidency are few and far between. Is it practical that he could run for office from prison? No, but I don't think there is a legal prohibition. Of course, that's something that the Supreme Court has never taken up because, you know, go figure, we've never had a presidential candidate behind bars during the campaign. So, but no, I, I think practically speaking, that's a non-starter. But that's just in this case, because there are other cases like the one being investigated uh, regarding January 6th that would have those barriers to, to him holding federal office in the future, correct? Exactly, because there are some statutes on the books, for example, a seditious conspiracy, I believe, that say if you are convicted of that crime, treason is another one of those crimes, if you are convicted, then the statutory punishment that the judge could impose includes banning someone from future federal uh, uh, office. So in theory, um, that is one way to stop not only Donald Trump from running for office, but any other of the insurrectionists in Congress, if they are convicted of any of those charges, they could also be banned from holding federal office. Now, this idea from Republicans that we need a special master, that's the, the, the talking point of the day. My take on it is, look, the DOJ already had a filter team in place. They've already separated out documents that don't pertain to this. No one really gives a shit about uh, about documents that weren't classified anyway. My idea is that bringing in a special master would just be a way for them to slow walk this whole thing so that they have more time to obfuscate the facts. Do you, do you have a read on this, on this whole special, special master situation? I, I do. It's all kind of uncharted territory, but he, here's my read. First of all, Judge Aileen Cannon, who is the judge that somehow got appointed to hear Donald Trump's demand to have a special master appointed. She's a Federalist Society member since 2005 when she was in her mid 20s. It's not what I was doing in my mid 20s. Yeah. I was, you know, finding out where I could get the cheapest beer and pizza. Yeah, Judge Cannon has been a Federalist Society member since 2005. I think it's worth noting that not only was she nominated by Donald Trump, but she was confirmed by Mitch McConnell's Senate after Donald Trump lost the 2020 presidential election. That tells us something. It's a, it's a data point. And Donald Trump made the demand that she appoint a special master. And here's something I've never seen in my 30 years as a prosecutor, Brian. The judge, before she even asked the prosecutors at the Department of Justice to state their opinion, to file their brief, to argue their case, she said, I tentatively am inclined to grant Donald Trump's request for a second master. That's not the way litigation is supposed to work. You hear from both parties and then you make your announcement, whether tentative or final. She didn't do that. Now she's kind of found herself in a tough spot because the Department of Justice filed a motion that legally and factually knocks out of the box every legal argument Donald Trump's defense team made as to why she should appoint a special master. 
Here's what I suspect she's going to do. I make this prediction at my own peril. She's going to try to save face by say, well, I'll appoint a special master only to review those few potential attorney client privilege documents that the prosecutors have already set aside and segregated as part of their uh, privilege review process. And the special master can look at those, but not, you know, the lion's share of the documents, which were the classified materials that Trump stole and was illegally concealing at Mar-a-Lago. That gives her an opportunity to save face. But here's the thing. We saw in the government's reply to Donald Trump's motion that they have already reviewed all the documents and they're already following up on all of the investigative leads and the national security leads to assess the damage that may have been done to our, our national security. So look, the horse is out of the barn and right. galloping around in the evidentiary <laughs> fe- field. And it really doesn't make sense to close the barn door now by appointing a special master. OK, so let's finish off with this. Republicans are claiming that everything was already declassified. Um, I've done videos on this myself, basically explaining that while Trump can initiate declassification procedures, it, it can't just be done by fiat, like especially with materials uh, related to human sources and nuclear secrets. But besides that, can you speak on why, if this is really Trump's defense, his lawyers didn't argue that in court? They didn't argue it in court because it's untrue. Donald <laughs> right. Trump, you know, Donald Trump can post anything he wants on his little media platform. Um, he can say anything he wants on Fox Entertainment. But if he had, in fact, declassified anything, that would have been prominently featured in the litigation in court. It wasn't. It's untrue. And then the, the other um, the other reason that this is a red herring is because the three crimes that the judge said there was probable cause to believe were committed and there was evidence of those crimes located on the property at Mar-a-Lago on August 8th, the day they went in to search, none of those three crimes require classification. So the whole thing is a Donald Trump production. It's a sideshow. It's irrelevant. Yeah. What's new? Uh, Glenn, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, and for anybody listening and watching, if you want to hear or see more from Glenn, check out Justice Matters on YouTube. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Brian. 